Hello and welcome back to the end of year Connextra's Veganza. I have for you a further look at this Thomas Duplex Super Safe Light. And quite honestly, it's not much of a further look, but I want to talk a little bit more about low pressure sodium lighting and also plug it into this guy because it turns out um, the power supply or the ballast on this thing is terrible. But I wouldn't have known that until I bothered to plug it into here. But to start out, I'm going to move the camera so you can look at the bulb and see it warm up in real time. Ooh. Okay, so I believe I have the camera in an auto exposure mode, which is what I want. Um, but before I actually start the lamp, I just wanted to explain that um, this is a very old lamp. I have no idea how many hours are on it, but I suspect a lot given the discoloration that is in that spot. Um, the other thing that is interesting about them is the fact that the sodium seems to always hang out in this part of the U. There are a couple of kinks in the uh, tube inside there, and I'm guessing that it's meant to restrict the sodium from moving around too much. And actually, I must admit, it's an assumption on my part that that is the sodium. I don't know what else it would be. Um, so that's why I'm like, oh, it's probably the sodium in there. But uh, the, uh, the fact that there's a lot more in this lamp than it actually needs, given that it doesn't all vaporize, um, I suspect this lamp is going to last for quite a lot longer, um, especially because, you know, <laughs> it may get started up a few times a year from me. Uh, but let me... Got to do a couple, a little bit of housekeeping here. Okay, I've changed the auto white balance to tungsten because if you don't, the lamp looks way too red once it's warmed up. But I will now plug it in and you will see a cold start. It's not that exciting, but uh, it is interesting how you see that sputtering happen at first. Um, and obviously the ballast in here has quite the hum. I have not looked into disassembling this to see if I could tighten it down or anything because it it doesn't just seem worth it to me. Because um, it honestly, this doesn't bother me. I saw someone in the comments say like, I could never deal with that humming going on. And I'm, I'm just very able to tune this out. But anyway, as this warms up, I wanted to talk about the fact that these lamps, you know, I said that they are very obsolete. They are in use in many places, but getting replacements now, they are very, very hard to find. I looked and um, I went to a thousandbulbs.com, which I know used to sell them, and now I'm kicking myself because I never bought a spare for this thing. And they only sell LED drop-ins. Now, I could probably put an LED drop-in in this safe light and it would, I imagine, work fine. I think the filters will do just a fine job. But, you know, I, I scoured the internet looking for um, different sellers of these and it's basically like you can find some on eBay or luck into some new old stock, but I don't know if any are being manufactured anymore. However, it almost seems like they only had a quoted life of like 18,000 hours, but I'm somewhat suspecting that, you know, unless they have a manufacturing defect, they just go and go and go. And the reason why I think this is that in my area, they are fairly common under bridges. So if there's, um, if there's one road going under another, for whatever reason, a lot of times there are low pressure sodium lamps hung from the bottom of the road up top, illuminating the tunnel created by that road. And, you know, I've noticed them since I was a little kid, because if you catch them at the right time, you know, they look red as they're warming up. They are still there. And I don't think I've ever noticed them get relamped. Now, maybe they have been. It's not like I've been staring at those roads every single day, but they are still there. They are still monochromatic yellow. I doubt they are LED replacements because why wouldn't they do something that's not yellow? The replacements I found, you know, you could get them in this very yellow color or you could get them in white. Um, 
So I don't know. I've just always had the suspicion that these lamps essentially last forever because so long as they will strike, you're gonna get the sodium to vaporize like it is now. I, I don't really understand the, the wear method of this type of lamp um, because it's, it's really a pretty mellow, mellow kind of emission, you know? It's, it's basically a fluorescent lamp, but it's even simpler than that because, um, you know, you don't have the phosphor to deal with. It's chemically fairly pure. As far as I know, it's just whatever the electrodes are made of and then the, uh, the sodium and that little bit of neon and argon. But someone let me know if I'm completely off base here and these lamps do actually fail with regularity. Maybe Illinois Department of Transportation has a huge stockpile of these lamps and I just never knew it, but I really doubt it. It just seems to me like they just go and go and go. I remember reading at one point that what usually happens if they fail is they will not, um, they just won't start glowing yellow. They'll stay that deep red or purple because the emission, uh, the sodium emission just isn't occurring. But, and, and that's, that's another reason why I'm wondering like, do they just go and go and go? Because if that's true, I have never seen one under those bridges that has stayed red. They are always working. They always light up perfectly fine. And I'm, it's fairly widespread around here. Plus some people had commented and I in fact knew this already that there's a lot of areas in San Diego that use low pressure sodium lighting too. So it's not like they're gone when I said that it's very obsolete. It's just, they are very hard to find these days. And um, hopefully this one keeps on going as long as it can. But you can see that still going. It's not quite fully warmed up yet, but it's close. I also find it interesting how um, at this point, you know, that it almost looks like the glass is actually glowing. Like there's this ethereal surface glow going on. And I don't know if you can see that in the camera. Maybe you could before. I've been talking this whole time. I can talk and talk and talk. It's almost like it's my job or something. I think, yeah, that's, that's, <clears throat> that's as bright as it's gonna go. And I do want to just show that one of the kind of nice benefits of this type, type of lamp, it has a very slow warm up time. Oh, and I have to wonder, with every, um, every increase in power output, the bulb gets longer. So only the 180 watt bulbs, um, had that 200 lumen per watt efficiency, but those things were enormous. They were basically like four foot fluorescent tubes, but this huge bulb thing and the fixtures which hold them look silly because they have these long, they're just these very long things. But um, anyway, I, I've i never seen one of those warm up and I wonder if it takes longer because the bulb itself is longer. But anyway, what I was gonna say was, while this has an extremely slow warm up time from cold, they actually can do a hot restrike, no problem at all. It's not good for it, at least they claim that to be the case. However, you can see if I unplug it and plug it back in, there you go, it's lit. It doesn't need to uh, cool down to start up again. It doesn't even have the slight delay of a high pressure sodium lamp. So for momentary power outages um, or power interruptions, whatever you wanna call it, this is definitely better in that respect. But now I'm gonna put the camera back on my lovely melon and talk about the uh, horrible power factor on this thing. You might actually get a better sense of how this is actually quite bright without the filters in place. Um, now that it's shining in the camera, you'll see that 
it's, it is a very bright light. It's just yellow. <laughs> very, very yellow. But anyway, when I plugged this into the kilowatt, which was just for curiosity's sake, I realized, wow, this is nowhere near as, um, as efficient as it would appear to be because, and it's interesting because the label actually says bulb power consumption, 35 watts, which is, it's a 35 watt bulb in there. However, if you look at the kilowatt, it is actually drawing about 72 watts, more than double that, which is surprising. A lot is being lost in the ballast. It's actually going down a little bit. I don't know if I ever plug this in and let it completely warm up. It read closer to 80 when the bulb is cold. Eh, it's 71.2.3. 0 0.1, 0 0.0. I'll leave this in. Um, I'll leave this on for a while and see what it bounces out to. But this isn't this isn't the real problem. It's the power factor. Uh, 0.2. I don't know if you can read that, but that's very bad. This clearly does not have a power factor correcting capacitor in part of its in its circuit because this is terrible. And what, what that means is, oh, 0.19, it got worse. Um, this thing is drawing nearly three amps, even though this is only 70-ish watts, which should be on 120 volts, a little over half an amp, it's near three. The power factor is that bad. So it's not actually consuming three amps times 120 volts in energy. Like this thing's not getting that hot, but it's taking, um, because the its draw of power is out of phase with the supply, three amps is going through this cable and this wire and in the power transformer outside. Uh, that's why power factor correction is important for when you, you don't want a bunch of things with a bad power factor because it makes, um, it stresses out components on the electrical system more because um, you get the reactive force. I'm not super great at explaining this and I might be getting the details a little bit wrong, but um, the reactive forces or, or that, I don't know if force is the right word, but because of this terrible power factor, everything is working harder to supply it with the energy it's consuming. Um, it's not actually consuming any more energy, but it's putting more strain on every part of the electrical system. And if you have a bunch of things that have a bad power factor, you do end up with like, uh, say you have a generator powering things, it's harder for the generator to keep turning when the power factor is really bad. So it's a, it's a complicated topic. I'm not an expert, but I do know 0.19 is awful. It's actually calmed down to 67, 67, oh, weird. It's, it's wavering between 0.2 and 0.8, stabilizing a little bit. Now 0.2, 0.5, 0.7, 0.2, 0.7. Uh, that's wild. But in any case, it's, it's below 70 watts, so that's that's good. I guess it really just takes um, significantly more power until the bulb is warmed up, which is the opposite of what I would have expected. But anyway, that's it for this simple video. Went on a little long, didn't it? But I will now unplug it because, uh, well, actually, you know what? I'll leave it plugged in until I set up the next video. But I did just want to point out that because nothing in here is actually getting hot, they're not like a, a HPS bulb where you unplug it and it's glowing for a while because it's incandescing. It just goes out right away. Nothing is actually that hot. In fact, the bulb, you know, if I, I'm doing it. It's it's uncomfortably hot. I think if I held on to it for a long time, it might burn me, but it's it's not really that hot. Uh, it's only 35 watts. Although maybe it's more like 60. Who either there's about 30 watts getting lost in the transport or the ballast, which could be the case, or else. Uh, this thing is overrunning the lamp quite a lot, which I suppose that's also possible. Who knows? It's so old. 
Um, but it's still working, and for that, I am grateful. Okay, goodbye.